I call to order the meeting of the Pasadena Independent School District Board of Trustees in special session on Wednesday, May 18th, 2022, in the boardroom of the Administration Building, 1515 Cherry Brook, Pasadena, Texas, at 5 o'clock p.m. Board members present are uh, Ms. Nelda Sullivan, Ms. Chris, mm, uh, Ms. Paola Gonzalez Fusilier, Mr. Casey Phelan, and myself, Vicki Morgan. Board members absent, Marshall Kendrick, pa um, I'm sorry, Crystal Davila, and Kenny Fernandez. Let the record indicate that a quorum of board members is present, that this meeting is duly called, and that notice of this meeting was posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The invocation today will be given by Ms. Sullivan and the pledges by Mr. Phelan. If you would stand, please. Would you please join me in prayer? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the many blessings that you've provided to us. We especially thank you for our district and for the many individuals who make it the successful school district that it is. As we enter the business of this district, we ask that you would be with us, lead and guide and direct us. We ask that you would be the lead with the leaders of our country, give them wisdom and strength to do the things that are the best for our country. Please be with our military, lead and guide and direct them and keep a healing hand upon them. These things we ask in thy name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. We are not going to have the first executive session, so we're and we have no public comments. Am I correct? No, okay. So we're going to move to um, the next order of business. If I can get the page turned. And this is uh, first. We're going to hear about the overview of the bilateracy uh, trajectory advisory committee (BTAC) work, and this is for information only. I believe that Rolando is on his way, but I'm going to go ahead and start um, because I don't, I don't see him. So the Biliteracy Committee has been meeting for the last um, full year with principals and assistant principals and teachers talking about our bilingual continuum that we've been, had in place for a long, long time and have been successful with. But we've had a lot of questions coming up about it over the last few years. So the strategic plan had us looking at that and reevaluating that work and making sure that we were doing it the best way possible for our students. It's been a long time since we've dusted it off and really looked at it. So, um, I think I just answered some of those early, but I told you who was the part of the, there was about 40 people who met every month. Um, actually, every board meeting, there was this meeting right before that, so I was always rushing over, but um, they had a, a lot of uh, input from some people outside and research that really, really helped um, us move along. So I am looking at something that is not what's up there, so that's really good. That's <laughs> that might be part of it. So the, the BTAC composition, you'll see there, uh, here he comes he's gonna save me but I'm, I'm done do y'all want to vote for this at this time I was introducing uh, the committee members Pardon. way to build tension good afternoon everybody sorry <laughs> I thought I had until 5 30 so um, the composition of the committee as dr. Hickman was mentioning included district leaders campus leaders uh, principals for middle and elementary campuses uh, several specialists, program specialists, and instructional specialists for uh, CNI faculty. We have teachers and instructional coaches. And we brought in two experts, a professor of bioliteracy development from UH Clear Lake and our consultant, uh, who was the former director of the TA Division for Language Learners. 
and is a co-author of one of the books that uh, we guided. She was the director of the Center for Advanced Linguistics in Washington. So she's a well, well-known uh, expert in bilingual development. The work that we uh, embarked on included uh, monthly meetings via Zoom. She was a stream in, and then we were live, a hybrid me method. We, uh, from April 2021 to April 2022, we conducted a book study on the guiding principles of dual language education. Uh, we did uh, updates on research, some of the uh, best instructional practices, overview, group discussions. We have a lot of surveys and polls. We also had the opportunity to visit a school in Galveston ISD that is implementing uh, kind of the same uh, program that we are exploring and presenting today. And some of our learning on research is, is important to give a context, right? We want our kids to be successful and we want them to be acquiring English. So this graph was published first in 2009. Uh, Thomas and Collier started researching and collecting a longitudinal study over probably seven million students across the United States in all type of programs. This research is still going on and the graph is still the same. And it shows uh, how the students perform in an assessment of reading in English. So what you notice here on the vertical axis is the normal curve equivalence, right? So we took all these types of tests and we created statistically an equivalent. And our goal is to get to the 50 percentile, right? That's where monolingual English speakers who are proficient do perform in, in English assessment. Now, let's see longitudinal. You see on the uh, horizontal axis the different grade levels. How are they performing, the students who are emerging bilinguals? So in the first uh, top one, I'm going to the top to the bottom, we have two way dual programs, right? Of which we have six programs here in the district. So they perform after the end of a school age all well over the average of 50 percentile. Then we have the one way dual, which is a 52. The transitional bilingual, which is a program we currently have in 34 of our 36 elementaries and all our middle schools, that gets us to a 40, so we are a little bit under that process. Then transitional with ESL, we do not that have that program here in Pasadena. The ESL content is where all teachers of the content are ESL certified. That's kind of the process that it gives us a 34. And the ESL pullout, this is the program that we have adopted here for those students who do not speak Spanish in the, in the elementary years, right? Uh, kinder to sixth grade. So this is nationwide kind of the results. Uh, we have not conducted a study, and I'm interested in, in pulling some data about that for the Pasadena, but if you remember presentations that I have done in a couple of years, we noticed that our major bilingual students kind of get very high when we go to third grade, and then they start distancing from the performance of all students. So we are following these patterns that uh, Thomas and Collier have found nationwide during this almost 20 years of research on program efficacy. So some key, key understandings that we had in the process. Program effectiveness. So research has definitely shown that dual language programs are much more effective in addressing the bilingual students' learning needs. The program participation is a key difference, right? One-way dual, and, and we, we need to start talking about those terms, one-way dual is a classroom consisting of 100% of the students being our emerging bilinguals. So think about transitional students, what we have in transition. Those are our one-way dual. The program duration, long-term participation, is uh, a very good predictor of success for our students in these programs. So the recommendation is to implement this, taking advantage of our uh, middle school 
uh, buildings from pre-K all the way to sixth grade. That way we guarantee kids seven years of exposure to this kind of instruction. And right now, where are we? We're, do we stop at third or fourth? Is that where the program? No, uh, that's a very good question. And this is very okay. appropriately to that question. Okay. So it is not that it stops. We, conti we continue offering bilingual until sixth grade. However, the instruction is very different, OK? So in this chart, what we're comparing is the two programs, the transitional bilingual and the dual programs. So if you see the language goal for the transitional program, what we currently have, is to develop English. How? By leveraging Spanish early in the school years, right? And if you remember the transitional goals, uh, very heavy on Spanish at the very beginning in kinder first and second. <laughs> by fourth grade, it becomes mostly English right. with some support in Spanish. The language goal for the dual programs, and it's dual is because we want to develop both languages. The language goal there is to develop biliteracy, meaning ability to read, write, and speak, and of course, perceive language for both English and Spanish throughout their career. The student characteristics. In the transitional group, we only have emerging bilingual students, which is the same constitution for our one-way dual. The two-way, which is what we currently have in our six schools, we have two groups of students, and that's what is called the two-way dual. It's dual for two languages, it's two-way because we have two groups of students. The English speakers and the Spanish speakers, right? In the one-way, will be only the Spanish speakers. The academic goals for all the programs are the same. We need to be successful academically. We want them to grow. That's the goal, right? We have standards for that. Now, the language allocation, when it comes to your question, Ms. Morgan, is in the transitional program, we start heavily leaning Spanish all the content with some English language development time that gradually increases. But by fourth grade, is mostly in English with little support in Spanish when needed. The dual programs is start and all subject areas are taught. There's a combination of teaching all subject areas in both languages throughout the school years. And we never go over, so the Spanish will never fall below 50% of the time. So all the way to sixth grade, we still have 50% of the time instruction in Spanish. That's the, the key difference for those two. So based on this work that we have done, uh, the committee is recommending to adopt a one-way dual language as the program to serve our bilingual students whose first language is Spanish at home in Pasadena ISD. I, I hate to stop you, but I have another question on the Please. page you're, you were just leaving. It sub says subjects are taught in English and Spanish throughout the school years. Is that through high school? At this moment, we're proposing it to do it all the way to sixth grade. Okay. However, it is feasible that our two-way actually teaches mm -hmm. all the way to high school subjects in Spanish. So that would be an interesting move forward eventually to consider how could we integrate the two-way with the one-way and maybe expand it the two-way in secondary to give more options to other students. Then how do we start, how do we begin testing students? Because obviously that's a, a right. question. And that's a, a key important consideration that's, that took up at least, it came in every single conversation of, <laughs> throughout the year, but it took at least two of the main meetings about assessment, right? And a key point that we have to keep in mind is that instruction and assessment are related, but are not necessarily the same. And, and I was just gonna go with a simple um, example, right? Our kids in high school in the two-way dual are taking biology and chemistry in Spanish. All the time is assessed in English. And our results have always been in the 99, 98% of students being successful. So it's all about the instructional pacing and the way we train the teachers to deliver the instruction in Spanish, bridging concepts to English so students are successful because 
those kind of knowledge transfer, right? So they're they're tested in English? Yes, ma'am. Okay. They will be tested in English and we'll still be taking uh, all LPA considerations have to be done kid by kid. Right. And so as we can do it, which is all the way to fifth grade, if they need to be tested in Spanish, they will be tested in Spanish until fifth grade, but we will be building them up to be successful because they're gonna be earlier immersed 50% of the time in English. So it will be a lot easier to transition those. Kids. That's good. Yes. Well, you know I'm a fan, so yes, my kiddos are. are in good language. <laughs> and just speaking from a brain development perspective, obviously it makes sense yeah. to start them earlier on doing both. Um, when would you want to start this program in the fall? No, that would be okay. way too soon. So uh, we're going to jump to uh, this was not part of it, but that's perfect because I have okay. a little bit. Number 12, please, Eric. 12. Yeah. And Rolando, before you, one of the ideas was to give you guys an overview. overview. And throughout the summer, when you have workshops, keep coming back to it, going deeper into different areas, answering more questions. Our, the, hope, the hope is next year to do training and then start with the early grades. Um, the following year. So we're going slow to, to get where we want to be. And we're, we're, we're going to have plenty of time to continue the conversation if after today you're thinking, oh, I didn't ask this, I, so that you guys have full confidence before we actually uh, vote to change the program. So I know you didn't finish your Ms. question. Ms. Sullivan. Uh, do we have teachers on staff that are qualified to do this? That's a very important question, Ms. Sullivan, and uh, we can s we definitely have the potential to work, and we're going to be working in staff development plans with our uh, our teachers, so they are our bilingual teachers can deliver this instruction because they are equipped to do it. Uh, initial literacy for both for this program is in Spanish, right? So we are teaching the students to read and write in their first language. So our teachers are stronger in those areas also. Uh, as I was uh, talking to the cabinet once, like it is very hard for me to be a phonics teacher of English for <laughs> kindergartens, right? There are sounds that I can obviously cannot make. I understand them, but I cannot make them. But our, our, our teachers, uh, there's just a way, and the research backs us up in terms of how to do that support. Does that satisfy your question? I have a second yes, part to that. A number of years ago, we uh, had the need to eliminate some bilingual classes because the children were all in English. So is it, are we going to be able to absorb or uh, utilize these teachers in this new program? Yes, we're probably when uh, we did a projection of the current numbers of teachers and we we have the teachers currently in place so we don't need additional teachers for all the way to elementary always we need teachers right Tony <laughs> so we always need teachers but in terms of like additional places to, to put them we don't need them we just keep the same units we have so this is kind of like the general proposed timeline uh, we already took a year on studying, right? So the idea is in the 22-23, do a, a planning year more in depth, which includes onboarding PD. We need to prepare teachers, principals, instructional coaches on how to address this change. Then that also gives us time to our specialists to make adjustments to curriculum and, uh, and assessment writings for pre-K to first. Then in year 23-24, we can launch the implementation with pre-K first. So we can start with three grade levels and then repeat the process for grade two. So professional development for teachers, curriculum and assessment writing, and an ongoing as a professional development for new teachers that come on board uh, on those grade levels that are already serving. Then in 24-25, we keep the expansion to go to grade two, uh, and we keep repeating until we get, so it will get us probably until 2029 20, to get to sixth grade. So it's one cohort. We start with three grade levels, but then they move one at a time. So the kids are also 
accustomed to that way of learning when they move up. I think it's great that you're moving slowly because it is a change and anytime there's a change obviously there's going to be hiccups and correct. so you can correct in the meantime so That's I think you've done a great uh, job and I, I applaud your work. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I want to repeat what she said. I think this is really well thought out and it seems very promising. I'm excited for what's about to come, but I do have some questions for clarity. Sure. When I looked at the page 10, one-way dual and two-way dual, at first glance, it seems like one-way dual is an intervention and two-way is enrichment. So that kind of brought me to the question, because two-way does so much better than one-way, right? You can look at the scores from page eight. It's a nine point um, difference. Correct. Will it be a logistical problem or capacity when it comes to offering two-way? So there's a little bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. The main point there is that for a two-way, the key for the two-way is you have enough English speakers or speakers of other language different than Spanish mm -hmm. who want to make part of the group. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so that's part of a challenge. Convince yeah. parents and get, like I think once we get moving, uh, it just will sell itself. Like parents will say, okay, I want to be a part of the two-way. And we don't want to abandon the two-way because we love two-way. And it's been super successful. So we want to see how can we strategically expand two-way and even utilizing some of these kids that are coming from the one-way to help us with those areas. So that's part of the issue, getting this, the students, uh, the parents committed to that participation. Because they need to be, for them especially, they need to be very committed, right, Ms. Fusilier? Yes, you need, very You need committed. to have a kid there <laughs> yes. all the time. So it's, it's, it's a very different challenge for them. So that's part of the reason we have. But it's a lot better option for our kids that are in transitional than the transitional, right? Mm -hmm. It shows a lot better results. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your information. And we look forward to hearing new things that are, mm -hmm. are uh, coming up and the questions that you can answer that we have Please. in the meantime. So I will be glad to be there. Thank awesome. you for the opportunity. Thank you. Next is consideration and possible approval, um, let's see, of the 2022-2023 student dress code pre-K through 12. So moved. Second. Motion has been made by Ms. Sullivan, seconded by Ms. Fusilier. Any discussion? I have some. I do. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Sullivan. We've seen such a complete change in our dress code over the years. And going into the schools, we see that the dress code is not adhered to. Uh, is it a problem with the um, principals or the teachers enforcing the dress code? So I don't know if the ASCDs want to come up or if I can just speak to it. I mean, I think I'd have to have more information than that. I mean, it's obvious that some schools have a definite different uh, focus on dress code than other campuses. It's something that we as ASCDs go over at the beginning of the school year and remind principals of. I mean, we just had a conversation. Troy came to me about graduation. I said, if it's in the handbook, they follow the dress code. If it's out of the handbook, like if you vote today to approve this, then yes, boys can have facial hair. You know, a couple of years ago, they couldn't have earrings. So yes, there have been changes and there have been approvals and uh, we have a process. You're very aware of it because you serve on that committee, but the input comes in, whether it comes from administration on campus, whether it comes from students, whether it comes from parents, uh, teaching staff, whoever, DEC goes over that information. Darla does a very good job going through and combing through all those recommendations, presenting them, and then giving lots of feedback time and voting time for DEC. That comes to cabinet. 
you know, whether we agree with it or not, we listen to our stakeholders. And then we bring it here for the board to make that final decision. So unless I have a specific campus or a specific you know, situation, I can just tell you that in my experience, uh, yes, some of them definitely have a better focus and a more uniformed uh, interpretation of what we meant than other campuses, definitely. Was a board member, uh, was there a board member participant? I know I did last year because that was the year that we approved the earrings for boys. Was there a board member participant? It was by Zoom this year. And yeah. there was someone it was invited. Ms. Sullivan. Okay. So I, it, okay, it was by did, you, did you go to the Zoom meeting? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. And I will say, I'm just going to add. Come on up to the mic just in case. It's not. Good evening, board members. This is on behalf of the whole ASCD team, including Alita. <laughs> this is not necessarily that some principals are throwing their hands up saying, never mind, I can't enforce it, let's just allow it. It really is a, a function of society and the surrounding districts and our, our teachers have students in other, um, other districts or in our district and they're noticing that difference. So it was, that, that's how a lot of those came about, even though that um, when you looked at our previous dress codes, we've been some of the last holdouts for a lot of conservative things, and so it's it's more in line with societal. Well, obviously, it may be in line with society, but I'm very conservative. Uh, and, obviously. <laughs> and when I looked at some of these changes, I said, there's no way I can support this. I mean, um, it was tough for me to support earrings for guys, but I supported it because that was a little thing. But we're talking about some pretty wholesale changes in some of the things like, like the facial hair, like no tucked in shirts, like no belts. You know, I understood it for the small kids, you know, no belts and all that kind of stuff. Um, Kids are kids, and they're going to push that envelope. And, yeah. you know, you talk about um, the girls can't wear the see-through blouses, but then again you say uh, it, you can't show any underclothing, uh, you know, on the tops. Well, okay, if they don't have a see-through blouse on, how do you see underclothing? I mean, th there's so just... So I think if that's low-cut or if it's tailored in such a way that their bra or undergarment showing. would show. Okay. That they would use their bralette as a top. Um, I made some, and then some of the uh, recommendations I recall from the Zoom were based on the parents who shop for clothes. Those are the things that are available. Like if you go to a mm -hmm. clothing store to be, you know, a cool kid, you're gonna. Those are the things you're gonna buy. Well, I've got two grandsons, but mm -hmm. they they follow the dress code. And the thing about it is, when I see pants or jeans with holes, okay, I understand holes below the knees don't bother me. And I understand that um, they have holes all the way down and on the butt and everything else, and that they have to wear something under that. But yes. that means that somebody's got to enforce that. And I'm not sure that that's going to continue to happen because I will just tell you, this concerns me. There's a lot about it that concerns me. Um, and I'm not sure at this point in time what's th what's the thing with belts why are we it was the same thing that a lot of the pants don't even have belt loops mm -hmm. anymore and 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 that's what we do say is you know on certain days they're going to dress professional you know get dressed for the job or whatever you want so as long as they look clean and neat the the teachers were like just the teachers mostly were saying that is it's not that they were throwing their hands up it was just why do we want to if if the rest of our area around us that's not a problem and and there's different there's a lot of different philosophies i mean we there are, have very liberal areas around us too and there are and philosophies that say but our dress code is what keeps us in check yes. and we we all see that side too so uh, ultimately it's in y'all's hands and we will do you know most of the say. time i don't have a problem with things this one um i you know i started looking at it and i said you know it's hard for me to approve Okay, you say facial hair's allowed. What's going to keep them from having a goat beard? A principal and an assistant principal saying that's not a well-groomed beard. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. It's they can be subjective. You know, I just um, I, I just feel like that it is it is extremely liberal and um, I'm going to be voting no on this one. 
Okay, well, we're just bringing it to y'all in the, I know, the process. I understand. And I appreciate your comments. Yes, ma'am. I have a question, and it wasn't discussed at, at the meeting, and it has to do with teacher dress. When did we approve that men could wear, men teachers could wear shorts, except for physical education? We haven't. That's not in our dress code, so no. it might have been well, a special day or... Uh, field trip not that or? I'm aware of, and I can't even tell you what school that I've been at lately that yeah. it was there. And it could have been a field teachers, day. Or? Teachers set an example, a strong example yes, of yeah. what their students wear. And some of our teachers need to maybe reread re the dress code. You know, that's a good point. We heard a lot of principals saying that was something they were going to do, reread the, the um, teacher dress code and some specific policies and make sure people really... So, I mean, that came out of this conversation. So, there and I know a, it wasn't during the Zoom that you were there. I'm sorry for interrupting, but it was after, like, right. that is a good point. You know, well, I only was Zoomed for a certain portion of right. it. And one of the other things that I thought we might look at because some of the schools have said, you know, I didn't get an opportunity to serve on that committee. And what was said there does not necessarily reflect the, the views of our student staff. So maybe when we have this next one, we might talk to principals, ask them to have a staff meeting and let all of the staff have an input and then bring that information to DEC. Okay, thank you. That That is part of the process, so if their campus didn't get to do that, we can make sure we follow up. But we do have everybody have input first, and that's what goes to DEC. So we'll verify to make yeah. sure everybody has the chance. If, the, if we could do that, then they would feel that they're a part they of the voice. decision because they've called and said, how, how dare we do this, you know? Yeah. And I said, well, you know, you had a representative. Well, she didn't represent the thoughts of the entire school so okay. maybe if we can do that and let them realize that they are a part of the process okay thank you thanks mm -hmm. I have a question okay on page 17 where it talks about head coverings um, the way that that's written I mean it could be confusing when head coverings are part of a religious just to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly yes no if it's okay. religious purposes that's not okay and that's not it's like talking about a hoodie that somebody would okay. try to hide under, and teachers know the difference. Yeah, okay. It would be culturally responsive. <laughs> Any and principals other questions? have discretion in those cases as and well. And that's written really big at the at the bottom there, that principals will all have, yeah, to be able to make those determinations. Did you have a question? Yes, I do have a question about the uh, mustaches and beards. I actually like that now we're going to allow students to wear that in school. This school year, I teach 10th graders, and for the first semester, they had to wear a mask. And sometimes when I will see them drink water, I could see that they had a mustache or a beard, you know. But for me, I think that's more, like you said, it's cultural. When it comes to young Latino men having a mustache, that's pride for them, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our students, I do have a couple of students who started growing a mustache when they were in elementary school. So to me, when it comes to having a 9 to 12 grade, I actually think it should be earlier because some of our students go through puberty at an earlier age. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, any other questions? Hearing none, let's vote on it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 So it's three no's and two yeses, so it fails. So, Darla, does that mean we revert to last year's dress code, or you have to bring it back again? Oh, ASCD, yeah. sorry. So, as of now, we would just stick back to last year's. That's the one that was latest approved. Okay. Okay, let's move to consideration and possible approval of a budget and design services agreement with Solace O'Brien for the Dobie High School Agricultural Complex Electrical up Upgrades project in the amount of $60,000 to be funded by fund balance. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Sullivan, seconded by Mr. Phelan. Discussion? 
So board members, this is one of those CTE good problems. We have so many kids involved in our FFA and our junior FFA in that area that we need more stalls for animals and electrical improvements to keep the animals lighted and warm and air conditioned and all those good things fans I'm, i know they don't have air conditioned troy quit shaking your head at me but they do have fans the poor little pigs so this is the addition that we were talking about and if i can add a comment it's my understanding that the concrete is already there so that's a big saving expense that that is there and then the other things would be added and i think it's just absolutely fantastic that we're having to add additional space i, too. I think this is such a great great program and it's kind of heartbreaking that we see the one on strawberry that is so empty so I think we're getting a lot of traction mm -hmm. there. We just have one school that doesn't have the program, so we're working toward that. That's I, good. That's Which good. school is in? South Houston. South Houston. Okay. okay, then let's consider the motion. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next is consideration of possible renewal of CSP number 20P. 041 DG for property boiler and machinery educators legal liability and crisis management insurance in the amount of eight million two hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred thirty five dollars so move second motion by Miss Sullivan seconded by Miss Fusilier discussion we have uh, Joe Blasey here in case y'all have any questions he's our expert <laughs> I know you had a question on yeah. the next one, but is yeah. there anything here on this item? Just, no. Oh, I a believe so. A question about the jump. I mean, just can you yeah. just explain the big difference in the cost? Yes. Uh, Joe Blasey with McGriff. Uh, we work with the district uh, as a risk advisor. Um, so fortunately this year, uh, our rates stayed relatively stable. For example, the property insurance, which if you own a building or even a home in this area, you know how that has really exploded in the last mm -hmm. few years. Our premium rate increased about 6.9%. The increase, the remaining increase of the premium had to do with the addition of other items, uh, construction inflation, um, additional buildings. We also added several vehicles. So the rates themselves remain the same. Just growth in those areas is what added additional premium to that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Okay, go ahead. I have a question. Yes, you said the word construction. We have several facilities under construction now. Do you insure those or does the contractor who's doing the building provide that's the insurance? A, that's a great question. So uh, what is traditional in large construction projects, particularly in the Gulf Coast, is for the owner to maintain a builder's risk insurance policy as opposed to having the contractors try to purchase that policy. And so Pasadena ISD, like several other uh, large construction owners for many years, has maintained a, a builder's risk policy to cover that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next is, and Joe, you're going to stay there. Yes, ma'am. Consideration of possible uh, renewal for automotive, student excess medical automotive, Flood, musical instruments, student travel accident, vocational interns accident, crime, general liability, law enforcement liability, and builder's risk insurance programs for 2022-2023 for $1,280,861. So moved. Second. Uh, Motion by Ms. Sullivan, seconded by Ms. Fusilier. Discussion? Okay, this is my question. Tell me what <laughs> yes, that means. Yes, I will. Uh, Dr. Powell, members of the board, uh, the district purchases a few supplementary policies uh, that cover incidents that the, the um, 
that may put a student or a student's family in harm's way. And so your question had to do with this particular policy that provides uh, excess insurance in the event a student is injured by an uninsured driver. For example, a student is being transported in a, in a bus and is injured by an uninsured driver. The district by law uh, is capped at what can be paid to that student or if there's multiple students injured in that event. Right. So the district purchases a supplementary policy uh, to address the, the financial expense uh, with medical bills and the like associated with that event. That makes sense to me. I just, I thought yes, maybe it was a typo or something. It just didn't seem to go together. So any other discussion, questions? I do want to let you know that we will be coming back to you with cybersecurity insurance. We had some things we needed to address to go out again and try to get a better rate. Uh, so we're going to be doing that, and then we're going to be going back and hopefully meeting those expectations so we can get a better uh, policy. So we are going to be coming back to you. So when I come back, just remember we were making some things right before we got that policy on the books. Joe, thank you for being here with yes, us. Thank you for having me. Okay, let's vote on the motion. And all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Motion carries. Next is consideration of possible approval of the canvassing of returns and declaring results of the Pestine ISD bond election conducted on May 7th, 2022. And Dr. Powell will read the results. So board members, the tabulation of the results of the election on Proposition A is as follows. We had 2,987 votes for, or 66.36%. 1,514 votes against, or 33.64%. The tabulation of the results of the election on Proposition B is as follows, 2,922 votes for or 65.66%, 1,528 vo votes against or 34.34%. And the tabulations of the result of the, of the election on Proposition C is as follows, 2,704 votes for, 60.89%, or 1,737 votes against, or 39.11%. So we're very thankful to our voters and our community for their support. Do I hear a motion? Motion. Second. Motion by Mr. Phelan, seconded by Ms. Sullivan. Again, we say thank you to our community. You have always been supportive, and uh, this was no exception. Um, we held our breath a little bit, but y'all did a great job in doing presentations and educating the community and um, headed by our incredible superintendent and all of you. Y'all just absolutely amaze me, and obviously you amaze the community, and I thank you. And I know the kids thank you. So that's the main thing. So let's vote on the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Motion carries. Now, the board is going to adjourn to closed section pursuant to Texas Government Code, Section 551.074, for the purpose of considering the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer employee, or to hear complaints or charges of charges against a public officer employee, or to hear complaints or charges against a public officer employee, review the superintendent's evaluation, consider board member self-evaluation. Self no further business will come before this board and will reconvene in open session only to adjourn. This meeting is now adjourned.